Welcome to season seven of my podcast, Between Us, Stories of Unconscious Bias. This season, I speak to people in Mexico, America, Ireland, Sri Lanka, India, and the UK. I have stories that I'm sure will resonate with anyone anywhere in the world. For example, how to be more confident, or how are we seen differently in the country of our birth, only because we don't look like everyone else. I also hear stories that are chilling, and I'm moved at how the speaker found the inner resilience to overcome their challenges. I hear stories of music, religion, and so much more. I hope you take away as much as I have when hearing these stories. Thank you so much for listening. I'd like to introduce Carlos Hidalgo. Carlos has more than four decades of executive management expertise and development of strategic programs for Fortune 500 mid carpet companies and for nonprofits. With an extensive knowledge of Latin America, Carlos has developed programs for Logoi Publishing, the Government Tourist Office of Mexico, and for bus builders in Mexico and Brazil. He has also had widespread experience in the nonprofit sector having served as the Chief Operating Officer of Word of Life, which is an international non-profit organization. And that capacity, he was working long range and day to day in 81 countries around the world. Carlos was recently appointed Commissioner on the Michigan State Commission on Spanish Speaking Affairs by Michigan Governor John Engler and served one term. Currently, Carlos serves as a member of the Governing Board of the Grand Rapids Area Chamber of Commerce. So it sounds to me that Carlos is a very, very busy person, and I am glad that you've made some time uh, to to talk to me, Carlos, and to share your stories of unconscious bias with me today. It is my pleasure to be here, Smita. Mm, huge pleasure. So, unconscious bias, Carlos. How do you how do you understand that? How do I understand that? Uh, well, are all, all the things that uh, creep up in me. Uh, when a certain situation occurs or I am in front of uh, individuals that makes me basically least likely to uh, appreciate those individuals. So that's that's what I what I think of unconscious bias, that it's there. I don't see it. And yet it creeps up. It catches up with me in certain situations. So, I mean, in that regard, Carlos, can you, can you tell us a little bit more about your unconscious biases, some story that perhaps you could share with us? Uh, when I was about nine years old and uh, my family uh, was uh, uh, from Cuba. We had been on vacation in the United States. We had been in New York. We had been to Washington, D.C. And we had ended in Miami prior to uh, going back to Cuba. I happened to be at a store, bent down to drink from a water fountain. And uh, all of a sudden I felt someone hit me in the back of the head and I looked up and uh, it was an employee of, of that of that store. And that individual said to me, hey boy, don't, can't you read? And I was confused and then he pointed to a sign over the water fountain that said colored only. And then he said, we white people drink from the this fountain. And there was a fountain with a sign over it that said white only. And this uh, is in America. This is in the United States. That is correct. Uh, and which year is that, Carlos? Since we can date it as well. 1954. So it was it was a while back. But still. Uh, my, mm-hmm. my father, my father was there. He saw what happened. He was. He was distracted looking at, at some items in the store, but he saw what happened. And when I look up, he came over and uh, looked at the employee and bent down and drank from the same fountain that I had just been taking a drink. He stood up, looked at the employee after that, and he said, are you going to hit me too? And the employee backed off. Uh, I looked at dad, he grabbed me by the hand, we walked away, and I said to him, dad, what, what did just happen here? All of this is in Spanish, of course, between him and I. And he said, uh, ignorancia, basically ignorance. And then he proceeded to tell me, and I was so overcome with 
a mixture of pain or grief. I, 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 I cannot explain it. I, I could not understand it. Um, and that, that began, I have been, tra I've traced my unconscious bias to that moment. And that's a very powerful story you're sharing it. And I wanted to get the date 1954, but, um, you know, for certainly some of us, uh, 1954 is not that long ago, perhaps, perhaps. Maybe no, no, but, 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 I, but I will tell you this, um, at another time I was in a Southern state. Uh, with my family, and that is much, much recently. This is probably in the late 90s. And um, uh, I was chatting with a, uh, with a, uh, again, we were at this time at a restaurant, and um, I was chatting with the maitre d', who happened to be Cuban. He had a Spanish name, and uh, there was someone, a patron there, who apparently understood Spanish and literally came up to me in front of my family and said, you Cubans are worse than white trash. So those two items there are kind of a parenthesis that explain my unconscious bias for people who come from Southern states. The moment, the moment that I meet someone from a Southern state, I, I go back to those two encounters and I have to take uh, I have to be cautious because not everyone in who lives and the majority of people who lives in southern states uh, are not that way. But nevertheless, it uh, as much as I try, it does rear up. Obviously, I handle it diplomatically and, and carefully and uh, uh, realizing that uh, we're all human beings and we have to treat each other with respect. But it does it does bubble up inside. And it's and, and it's a, there's a 40 year gap between uh, the the first experience and the second experience, give or take, a 40 Correct. year gap. There have been there have been other experiences that uh, uh, in southern states um, uh, that that have reinforced that view. They have been uh, experienced with law enforcement um, in terms of my being stopped and everything was fine. Uh, sir, how are you? Uh, fine. I said, uh, officer, what did I do? He said, you were going over the speed limit, sir. Uh, may I have your driver's license and registration, sir? Here you go. And then he sees the name and he says, uh, you were going pretty fast there, boy, weren't you? Um, I had a son of mine in my car, my youngest son. So I went from a white person being called sir to a boy after my name was seen in the driver's license and registration. So it has been reinforced uh, a few times uh, since then. Uh, again, uh, I've had encounters with law enforcement before. That was not the case. Uh, I was treated with the utmost respect. But it just uh, it, it just goes to, to show you that those situations uh, create uh, emotions within at least me uh, that Again, when I travel in the South, I'm always conscious and I'm always looking. Um, but why only in the South? I'm just, it's interesting because I'm, I'm also thinking because the, you, the fact that you, you were nine in 1954, we can guess your age, give or take. Uh, and obviously you, you, are, you were young enough or, or you were of the age to remember the Cuban Missile Crisis. So fast forward to the 90s or all the other occasions where people have pulled you up. My first question to you, and that's my ignorance, so forgive me, Carlos, is well, your name a particularly Cuban name or is it just a Spanish well, name? Well, but my name, my name is Carlos Hidalgo and, and in the United States, uh, Carlos Hidalgo is a Latino name, uh, whether it's black or, or brown or, or Asian or ethnicities. And, and, um, and yet, I am European by by uh, by genealogy. My my mother and, and father uh, are Europeans. So uh, if you look at me, uh, I, I I do not look like a quote unquote the stereotypical Latino. Uh, but you 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 look white. Let's let's face it, right? I mean, I've I've met you, and so I know that your face doesn't is not is not a shade of brown. It's more right. more white. Right. And of course, you'll have a local American accent. Uh, and so you fit right in until you mention your name. I do, and and uh, so 
<clears throat> has this happened in, in the northern states? Yes, it has. And, uh, uh, but not to the degree, uh, it has not impacted me. And, I, and it is, I don't know if it is because it has happened more in the Midwest. Uh, it never happened in, in New York City, where I live most of my life. Of course, New York City is a melting pot. In the Midwest, it has happened a couple of times. Um, so I think it adds to that, but it is, it, I, I think it is because it started in the southern states and it has happened more often to me in southern states in the United States. Right. So I'm, I mean, I'm going to just to deliberately be slightly provocative and ask, are you sure it's not confirmation bias? Uh, yeah. Because certainly a very common uh, unconscious bias is confirmation bias, where you go to a certain place or you go to meet a certain person and you say in your head, actually, that's going to be an awful environment to be in. It uh, is, and then, it, of course, you only, you only experience what you expect to experience. It, it, it is, it is, it is, uh, uh, I'm glad you brought that up because confirmation bias is the worst thing in the world. Um, it, it makes us think and do things that, uh, that make absolutely no sense. But yet, uh, uh, the mind and the emotions do cause. So I do go prepared when when I go to the South, confirmation bias kicks in, yeah. uh, which yeah. which again, I am an adult. I am a thinking adult. I'm a rational adult. So therefore, I understand that all of these emotions, 99% of the people I've met in Southern states are lovely and kind and wonderful. Uh, so I do not want to paint a picture of, of, of the Southern states in the United States as as, as a place of, uh, of horror. That's not true. And neither is the Midwest. Um, but this is about me, not about them, not about the folks there. This is about something that happened to me when I was a little boy. But I do know even today, for example, in some remote parts of India, because of caste, unconscious bias continuing to show, but rear its ugly head, that's the phrase you used. Um, amongst modern society and even with this police person pulling you up because you're speeding and suddenly going from sir to boy you know it just says a lot about about humanity and how we approach things and well, their I, stories I suppose yes I, I believe I believe that the race problem in the United States or the world for that matter unconscious bias that turn into conscious bias. And, and let me explain that. Uh, I, believe, I believe that that hate of races, or hate of, of a group of people, um, the color of their skin, or their ethnicity, or their economic status. Uh, in India, uh, the, the caste system, um, all of that, is, is something that is learned, and it's learned in the home. And uh, it's learned, we can all go back, I believe, if we ask the question of a group, when was the first time that you heard a pejorative against a people group or based on their skin color or based on their ethnicity? Do you remember when and do you remember who you heard it from? And if you ask that question, I believe you'll get an answer that says, oh, I heard it at home from an uncle or I heard it at home from my father. Uh, not just once, but I grew up hearing it at home. And it's passed on from generation to generation to generation to generation. It is, it is irrational, but then it's unconscious, but it becomes conscious at times. So there is this flip back and forth, uh, which it's throughout the world. No, and in fact, what you're saying is, is, is very important, and I want to kind of uh, uh, um, capture that for the listeners and for my own sake. And this, you know, you used the word fingerprint earlier, and I want to use that word again in, in this context, because it is about our stories and how we think about things will unconsciously, we will say things to our children. I mean, maybe, and I, I don't know whether you have, you may have said things about the southern states to your own children when they were little, about, oh God, do we have to go to Florida, for example? I'm not making it up, Carlos, but you know what no, I mean? No, I understand. Yeah, and it could be then that then those young children who are eight or 10 or 15 at that point think, oh, we don't want to go to Florida. That sounds like an awful place. 
And so they eventually go for the first time ever when they're 25 and, and expect to see something that they will not like purely because of how they've been brought up. And Absolutely. I mean, that's a, that's a small thing maybe in the large scheme of things. Um, but certainly if you're parented and your parents are talking to you about race or, you know, gender, or sexuality, there are so many things that, that often parents share and discuss and, and create pejorative comments without even realizing. Yeah. Uh, and that you don't realize then becomes your fingerprint. You're absolutely right. And, and think about it. Think about it. You, there is a three-year-old, a four-year-old, a five-year-old playing around the house. Uh, uh, you're not a, even aware of the child at the time and you're speaking with an adult. And exactly. you, are, you are letting go of what you think of so-and-so or this people group. And that child is hearing those words and is interested because in the in the Grand Rapids Area Chamber of Commerce, uh, we initiated a program uh, called the Institutes for Healing Racism. And part of it was uh, getting getting individuals together, business people together uh, of different races and, and, and different colors and ethnicities. Uh, and these were these were uh, middle level and high level executives and sharing their stories. And the, one of the questions asked by the moderator was, when was the first time you heard a pejorative against a people group? And every individual, and, and I was in many of those meetings, every individual had the exact time that they heard it and who they heard it from. And then the next question is, was that reinforced throughout your growing up years? And the answer was yes. So by the time you get to, you go from four or five to 15, 16, that is, that is the, the group think of your home. Uh, and, and against a people group or against a, a political party, whatever it is, whatever it is. And uh, that's what you believe. Uh, because you've heard it over and over and over again, and you've heard the jokes, and you've and it heard becomes the, the new normal, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, you've heard the put downs and the jokes, and and you can't trust those people because they're dirty. Uh, you can't, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and and uh, it 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 works that way. Um, Smita, I remember uh, watching a a documentary. As a matter of fact, I believe it was a BBC documentary. Uh, the Troubles in, North, in, in Northern, uh, Northern uh, Ireland. And they interviewed a little Catholic boy and they interviewed a little Protestant boy. Uh, they could have been no more than seven years old. And the question was very simple. Do you, to the Protestant boy, they said, uh, do you like Catholics? And he said, no. And the following question was, why not? Because they're dirty. Interesting, they interviewed the Catholic boy and they asked him the same questions. These were angelic, cherubic, beautiful little boys. And uh, the question was, do you, do you like Protestants? No. Why? Because they're dirty. He repeated the same word that the other boy did. They are dirty. Now, what did they hear that? They didn't make exactly. that. Exactly. Exactly. And then, then it goes into the extreme, and then you have a civil war um, during the troubles. So, unconscious bias can turn into conscious bias very, very quickly if you let it go. Absolutely, and 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 in fact, in some ways, when I'm thinking unconscious and conscious, um, even when those little seven-year-old boys were saying. We don't like, uh, you know, whoever we're speaking to, we don't like that child because they're dirty. I mean, that's not even a conscious bias. That's still unconscious. They're just saying it's split second because that's part of their DNA. That's what they've only ever heard from zero to seven. They don't I'm... know that there's another way to think or to articulate that question. They just answer the way their siblings, their uncles, their parents have answered it. Always. That is correct. And then, then obviously, all of that turns into confirmation bias. Exactly. And we look for confirmation bias situations so we can be confirmed in our 
in our beliefs, however Who crazy. Who wants they to are. be wrong, right? We all want to be right. So it's not very nice being wronged or wrong. Uh, so if you are in the wrong, it doesn't sort of nice feeling. So we'd much rather just find this confirmation bias and be right. But no, please, Carlos. I mean, could you could you share another story with us? Uh, I I grew up with um, in a lovely home uh, with a dad and a mom who loved each other, and and that's security, especially for a child. And uh, uh, a lot of cousins around, a uh, lot of a uh, lot of family, uh, lots of love. Uh, wonderful, wonderful situation. Um, and then at the age of thirteen. Uh, Fidel Castro and communism came into Cuba, mm. and uh, things went from wonderful to terrible and horrible in a matter of months. Um, firing squads were fired up, uh, uh, were set up. Uh, thousands of people were led to the. It was like 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 the French Revolution, uh, the guillotine in Cuba. Anybody could denounce someone else. And j'accuse, which was was happening in France during the uh, the French Revolution, I accuse you. And the, the trials would last maybe 15, 20 minutes. They were all televised, and uh, the sentence was death. And from uh, there was no appeal. Uh, and while even the trials were going on, which by the way were televised, you could hear the executions taking place outside, and the executions were also televised. And as a 13-year-old uh, in school, we were made to watch those executions, and uh, we were we were told that uh, this is what happens to the enemy of the revolution. So it is it is said that the victors write history, and that is true. Uh, there is a rosy picture of uh, Cuba and romanticism and Robin Hood uh, of, of Fidel and, and, and Che. Uh, we, we don't call them by their last names in Cuba. We don't call them by Guevara or Castro, mm -hmm. we call them Fidel and Che. Uh, but that wasn't the case. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was horrible. Uh, informants, families were turned turn against each other and children were denouncing parents and, and uh, committees for the defense of the revolution, which was really secret police driven, were set up in every block in school which were immediately intervened. That was a word that was used by saying they were intervened by the government. And we went from, um, from having X, Y, Z teachers to teachers who conformed to the revolutionary ideas. And, and we were told, if you see anything your parents are saying or doing, uh, come and tell us. Uh, so it, 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 was, it was bad, bad news. And that's how I ended up in the United States. My, my family sent me to a school here in, in uh, the state of Missouri, uh, and it um, to keep me away, thinking that the U.S. would intervene. And um, I didn't see my parents again until I was 21. So oh my! Uh, I lived in the United States alone, and um, kind of had to grow up very, very fast. Um, this country has been kind to me. Uh, the people in this country were very kind to me and to many other Cubans who came here as exiles and refugees. Uh, but uh, it gave me an appreciation for, first of all, uh, being being reared in a, in, a, in a family where integrity and truth and love was prevalent. And I think that's what kept me going. Um, uh, we were we were a positive thinking family and we were a family that uh, uh, could achieve anything if you worked hard and told the truth and played by the rules. And that helped me. That helped me uh, very, very much in the United States. That's a little bit of my story. It's a, it's a very powerful story, Carlos. And I just want to, to react to a couple of things in that. One is this idea of, and I use the word trust for want of a better word, um, because I, when you were sharing your story about the revolution and at the time where you know, you you were questioned and people couldn't trust anybody else. And I was thinking of the Cultural Revolution in China and I was thinking of Albania, where within families themselves, uh, people were, you know, just, they, were, they would have found it difficult to say anything in case one of them was carted away and, and, and executed or, you know, or, or worse, or put into jail or something. So this idea of the word trust, and I and I just want for you to, 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 to comment on that, but just to, to continue in the second part of what you said, 
um which also i'm thinking about you and your unconscious biases and the second part is about you're then being alone in i uh, guess you come to the united states before you come with your parents for example when you were 9 but 13 is such a young age and and then for the next 7 years for the right reasons your parents feel you are alone and you are having to do what i call grown up stuff and taking care of yourself so well, can I, can i just hear about these two things about the idea of trust uh, well, even though you had a loving family prior to my leaving cuba uh and i want to make a correction the revolution came, started at thir- uh, when i was 13 i didn't leave cuba until i was 15 Um, and I left Cuba at 15 um, because things had just gone to the point that there was my parents were afraid I was going to be drafted into the army. The 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 age for for the draft had gone um, down to 16, and there was talk that it would be 15. Uh, and when I came here, uh, I came here just a few short, uh, a couple of months short of the Bay of Pigs invasion. So when the Bay of Pigs invasion happened. uh it cut off my parents we we couldn't i couldn't go back they couldn't come out but taking me to the airport uh, uh just a, a two months before i left cuba my my older brother uh died in an accident uh, so here's my mother uh losing a son to death and then losing another son to exile and so she said her goodbyes to me at home and my dad drove me to the airport and and we sat in the car and he said i want you to listen to me carefully uh before we go inside because i don't know if i would have we will have time inside to for me to say to you what i need to say to you he said everyone says that we've lost everything don't you believe that because that is not the truth the things that we lost are not the important things in life The important things in life first of all is the love that you have seen in your home. That's one. Number 2 is the integrity that you have seen in your home and the integrity that you have seen in your mother, the integrity that you have seen in me, the integrity that we have taught you over the years to you and your your siblings. That that matters. What also is important is the the truth. and the ability to speak truth always speak the truth even when the words that you speak will come back to harm you you speak the truth always and he proceeded to 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 give me this lesson on on the on the the issues of life that are important he said those are the important things that no one can take away from you The other things we lost, it's properties and money and position, but integrity and love and truth, the ability to think for yourself. That no one can take away. No one can take away your honor. Now, every one of those things you can give away. But no one can take them from you. And my prayer for you, my son, is that as you go to the United States you will not give those things away and we don't know if we'll ever see you again but remember that you have been loved you are loved and you will always be loved and never forget that you are a Hidalgo and those words in the car at the airport as a matter of fact I have them printed and they hang in my office uh it's more extensive than uh, what i have just said but those words kept me kept me very very straight i was in new york city during during uh, lsd and psychedelic and woodstock <laughs> and all of that, all and, of that free lo- yeah. and free love and i am a 17 18 year old alone and those words kept me in the straight and narrow hey paul pulgaros um you were very lucky to have that wisdom and also just as you left and also clearly your parents knew that's why your mother didn't want to come to the airport they both knew in their hearts that they may not see you for a few years and that's a tough tough decision as parents to make to say they, let us send our son away for the betterment of his life but we may not see him and especially having lost one son 
it's heartbreaking and it's wonderful and brave and shows their integrity and love and and uh, we have six children we they are adult children uh, we have 23 grandchildren uh, some of them are thank That's you wonderful. Some, of, some of them some of them are adult uh, in college or out of college uh, uh, in university or out of university and they know those stories they know those stories of their uh, uh, great grandparents they know they know the words that hang in my office and and uh, we i have i have uh, to the best of my ability tried to honor uh, my father and my mother and their bravery, as you said, to to sacrifice themselves for me, to send me, and perhaps never see me again, um, because they valued the words that they 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 used. It was more than words; they lived it. And uh, I've tried to honor that, not only in my life, uh, by the way, not always successfully. Um, I have to no confess, one's perfect, I, Carlos. I, we I have only to, try. I, I have to confess that sadly there have been times that I've given it away, uh, and then the conscience and the words of my father speak to me, and uh, I try to make amends. So, but um, we raised our six children that way, and uh, fortunately I see them uh, doing the same with their children, and it's very, uh, it's. It's basically the greatest gift I've ever received. Uh, the greatest gift that I've ever received was a, an affirmation of what I saw made into words in a car at Havana Airport uh, by my father when I was 15 years old. I'm just silent because I'm, I'm, I'm just appreciating what you've just said, Carlos. It is, it is moving, it is powerful, and it is for all of us to appreciate and understand, because that is also an unconscious bias, right? Um, because it's, it's about, it's a positive unconscious bias. People always assume unconscious biases are always negative. But that idea of integrity, of strong values, was, they carried that, your parents, and I'm going to use that lovely word you used earlier, they fingerprinted you with that, with the same values. You took that and you've done the same with your six children and you are now watching your six children doing it with your 23 grandchildren. Yes. And, and that is so beautiful because this is, this is, you know, we talked about the DNA and about how you can hear a little seven-year-old saying, I hate the Catholics because they're dirty or the other way around because that's what they grew up with. But your DNA, because of how your parents parented you and that one powerful moment because you were probably worried excited maybe but also worried because you were leaving the country you were going to go away to another country on your own there were all these things going on in your head and then your dad speaks to you and gives you such words of wisdom that you you hug on you hang on to that and that's you and you carry that through and it's still there in your office today and that that just then became your dna and i love that it's a great story thank you carlos thank you so is there any sort of mantra, if you like, any, what do you do on a daily basis? Um, because we all make mistakes, you're absolutely right, none of us are perfect. How do you manage to challenge your unconscious biases? Well, well, I, I pray. <laughs> uh, when I'm in a situation um, where, where I detect that there is something going on, I pray. And I basically what I do, Smita, is I look at the other person and say, that person... That person is made in the image of God, and however, however you believe in God, uh, I do, uh, and they're made in the image of God just like me, and that person makes mistakes just like I do, and that person is convicted just like I do, and if I bet that if we really sat down and, um, and, and got to hear each other's stories, uh, we wouldn't feel this way about each other. So I, I, th those are thoughts that run through my mind, and uh, uh, and I, I I just pray. I said, uh, Lord, just just help me, help me to see that person the way you see them. God, let me uh, help me to see that person the way you see them. And and that helps me. That that calms me down, and that brings me down to earth, and that takes me away from being a judge 
to being another human being, encountering a human being. And um, I've been in situations where I know I'm going in where uh, my ethnicity, uh, especially when, when I was in the Spanish speaking commission for uh, uh, affairs for the, the state of Michigan, I was a commissioner for, for a, uh, a region of Michigan. I, I was a target. Uh, obviously, the moment that happens, that becomes that becomes an issue. And uh, I did a lot of praying, and I did a lot of um, uh, soul searching, and uh, that's how I that's how I deal with it, um, because it is it is basically irrational. Um, a few incidents happened, and then you ascribe you ascribe those incidents in your life to a whole group of people or to a whole region. So so unconscious bias is, while it is rational because it did happen to me, and no one can deny that this happened to me, it is, call it a trauma, call it a, wh whatever you want to call it, it did happen, that, that fear or that thinking uh, cannot be ascribed to the world cannot be ascribed to to other store employees of that particular store um, so I have to I have to bring it under control and I have to do that and 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 the way I do is through prayer that's beautiful and if I were to summarize that um, when we look at somebody else don't be a judge be a human Correct. Don't be a judge, be a human being, just because they are human beings. Exactly. Carlos, Carlos Hidalgo, I have really appreciated your conversation with me. We've learned a lot about Cuba. We've learned a lot about fingerprints and how fingerprints go carry through generations. I think the listeners will enjoy this and, and take away a lot from it as well. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Mita. It's been a pleasure. I'm proud to announce that my podcast series is now heard in 104 countries, ranging from Guadalupe to Iceland, Argentina to Palestine, and Morocco. It is ranked in the top 3% worldwide. This is clearly a series that connects with people all over the world, and you are one of them. I thank you for listening. I would also like to thank Jack Godfrey for his original music in the closing of each podcast interview. If you like this episode, please do share, rate and review. I am Smitha Tharoor. Until next time.